This episode is brought to you by the Arvada Center. Experience the regional premiere of the off-Broadway hit Natasha, Pierre, and the Great Comet of 1812 running February 16th through March 31st. This musical extravaganza brings futuristic electropop sounds to a scandalous slice of war and peace as the venue transforms into a Russian cabaret with immersive bar and table seating. Don't wait. Get your tickets now for Natasha, Pierre, and the Great Comet of 1812 at arvadacenter.org slash events. That's arvadacenter.org slash events. Today on CityCast Denver. Construction on a better, faster bus line is finally set to begin on Colfax later this year, and the NIMBYs are NIMBYing. Me and producer Paul Caroli are gearing up for another transit fight by looking at the results of the last one over bike lanes on 7th Avenue. Plus, Taylor Swift is worried about deep fakes. Should Colorado voters be too? Today is Tuesday, January 30th. I'm Bree Davies, and here's what Denver's talking about. Hi, Paul. Hey, good morning, Bree. How do you pronounce Buena Vista? Buena Vista? Buena uh, Vista? I, what a classic question. Classic that, Colorado this is, question. I feel like this is a Colorado temperature taker or something. It's like a transplant test. This is yes. the kind of thing that I've always felt very self-conscious about. And totally. And will rarely express a strong opinion about. Yeah. Although working in this medium, you'd think I would you know, have a better idea of how to pronounce some of this stuff. Well, this was part of uh, a story from the Denver Post. How do you pronounce these Colorado places? And they have a little poll. And that was the first question, which I also found interesting because I, I agree with you. I think it is definitely a transplant test. Should we do this poll? This is fun. Yeah, let's do it. That's the first question. Uh, is it Buena Vista or Buena Vista? Um, I know the people I know who live in Buena Vista say Buena Vista. Really? Yes. Because I would say... As pronunciation of Spanish names and words go in this country and especially in this state, I would also assume that it was Buena Vista. Mm -hmm. However, I have heard many people over the years call it Buna. Buna? Wait, no, that's what I'm saying. Buna. I think that's what I've heard. Buena Vista. Not the actual not Buena correct Vista. pronunciation. Yeah, which not is the Spanish. Buena. I, I, Buena Vista, I think, is what's right. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know if I think it's right. I just know that's what people say. Right. The right and wrong is like, you what know? is right and wrong? You know, people that live there probably have a way of saying, whatever the mayor says, we should call their library. That's That would be authoritative. We have However, a lot they of librarian the listeners too. Maybe they could help us out. Maybe someone from Buena Vista will call in. Buena Vista. I, I, although I just did the poll and it looks like that that is, the results are in and most people say it's the other one. Buena? Yeah. Mo at least most Denver Post uh, readers say buena. I would I would guess D Denver versus people that actually live there might I be a different so story. I think so too. The next one I find interesting though because you and I do say this differently. Uh, <laughs> How do I say it? Ure? You say I Ure. Say you, I, I, I would say Ure. Ure. I swear I think. I've heard you say Ure. I, I, you know, honestly, this is another one I would just not say. Okay. <laughs> I would avoid talking about it. I always said Ure. Uh, so it's o Ure. I think Ure? I'm Ure? voting Ure. Ure I'm, or Ure. I, I'm voting Ure as well. Overwhelming Denver Post readers agree. 84% say Ure. Okay. This one is kind of a no-brainer. This is also like, if you moved here in the last six months, you might get this confused. Otherwise, you're pretty quickly corrected, which is how do you pronounce Louisville? Louisville, for sure. This is not Louisville. That's not how we say it here. Yep. It is, is Louisville. Denver Post readers agree with us on that one too. Let's see. Let's Salida see. is next. I've never heard anyone say Salida, which is their other option. I This one threw me a little bit as well because I have never heard anything but Salida. Yeah, Salida is the one. Yeah, that's a 93 percenter. There's, there's consensus here. And then the last one is L-I-M-O-N. You know who says this wrong? Who? who? Siri. <laughs> yeah. What she does says Siri Limon. Say? <laughs> it's Lyman. Yeah, no, Siri's wrong on that. It's, I think it's Lyman too. Those are the options. Limon. Lyman, Lyman or Lehman. 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 It's, it's Lyman. No, it's Lyman. Yeah. And Denver. Okay. So we're, we're generally with consensus. It's interesting that Buena Vista was such a, um, was so split. I think Maybe it's there's because... something changing in Buena Vista or like, I don't know. It, it, this could be like population changes too. Because the more Spanish speakers I bet that live there, they'll probably just say 
the you know the correct spanish pronunciation of those words not the not the white people version right that's kind of how i think of it is like this is a white people version of saying something yeah. but yeah well i'm sure there's the there's a history to it which maybe we'll look into it i know point. maybe if any of you all are from buena vista and you have any inkling into why it's pronounced that way we would love to know um let's get to the news yeah the ai election so uh, Secretary of State Jenna Griswold announced last week um, that she's rolling out her big asks of the Colorado State Legislature, which includes criminalizing fake elector schemes, guaranteeing tribal consultation of voting rights. And most interesting to us, at least, was the AI transparency and enforcement. Paul, I hate to touch the subject because I know nothing. I don't understand it. I don't know anything about you know, it. You haven't experimented on these, on ChatGPT or no, any of these? No, I'm so scared. You should check it out. Some, some of, I, I, I actually am at the point where I'm feeling like I should be more familiar with it. Like my wife works for uh, GitHub and they have access to Copilot, which is like one of the more cutting edge technologies. And she's getting really good at it. And she's Ooh. like really incorporating <gasps> it into her work and it's making her better at coding. Let's have and Megan so I'm on. Like, we should, I mean, sh- sh- it's, it's exciting I um, wanna learn. in I'm, some ways. So are you gonna, so do you just log on as her and use it? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, 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 Mr. Microsoft. I've never done that. So it's being used in different industries right now. I mean, even in ours, I think it's come up as a uh, issue of concern or at least conversation um, around editing uh, of voices and maybe sure. replicating our voices yeah. and how that could be used for good or for bad. Um, what is, I guess, what is the Secretary of State sort of getting at here? Or what are her concerns? Well, that's what I thought was interesting here because she late, so this is her priorities and she's saying AI is going to be an issue. And then, so here's, well, here's why she thinks it's a problem. She says, AI technology is used to create deep fakes. By manipulating a person's actions or speech, deepfakes can be used to effectively spread disinformation. I mean, we saw this last week was a, a Taylor Swift herself, <sighs> our queen, America's sweetheart, um, came out um, because I guess there's been some like deepfake porn versions of her online, oh which, gosh. you know, despicable, but it is the internet. <sighs> um, and she's she's got the, the Biden administration even talking about it now. So I, I understand why, why Jenna Griswold would be worried about that. Here, but that's the thing. I understand why it's a concern, but then this this next one is like, I'm not sure what government is supposed to do about this. Because here's Jenna Griswold's next point. She says, Coloradans deserve to know when the content they are consuming is real and when it has been altered by AI. Deserve huh. is a hard word there. I that don't is know a, that is what a weird Coloradans choice of, deserve. That feels like that's always something that politicians use to push their point. I think you should. Mm-hmm. Me, deserve means you deserve this and like in in like a way that feels a little bit i don't know if it's like pushy or there's something about it that is is insinuated when you say deserve i mean i think we all have the right to clear and concise and factual information is that what she's saying i again a right like a right to clear information i guess that would be nice i mean when we're presented with information about voting for someone who's representing our interests I, I mean, there's know. already misinformation about candidates out there. It's like, true. I could go online and write lies. But it's doesn't true. have is it that so different from a deep fake of someone like me putting words in their mouth? I, I so let, let's just go on. There's okay. more to it. So she also says um, she's got a bill. She's got uh, she's putting for. She wants someone to propose for. It's uh, she says this bill requires AI generated communications that feature Colorado candidates or office holders have disclaimers so Coloradans know they may not be real. Huh. So Which like, okay. Again, like good luck enforcing that. Yeah. I was going to say, how do you enforce that? I, I don't know. I mean, also the companies themselves, they don't have rules about this. They're, they're not like watermarking. Which is part of the bigger conversation, of, yeah. right? Um, is the companies in the first place aren't, aren't watermarking or making these, these uh, things clear mm-hmm. to us. So how can we expect them to follow? Mm-hmm. Rules. And then this last one is, uh, she says, this bill requires deep fakes and AI generated media that feature Colorado candidates or office holders have disclaimers. So that's literally the same thing I just read. <laughs> how, is, how did that even happen? I don't know. Well, it's AI generated communi- communications uh, yeah. versus AI or, or, versus deep fakes and AI generated media. I see. Okay. That is a little different, although uh, I'm not sure. It feels if pretty it apples is. to apples there for me. But yeah, I, I understand that there is a range of things. Like I've 
I've seen, they were talking about this on the Hard Fork podcast, the New York Times show. This is like Kevin Roos and Casey Newton, a couple of tech journalists. They're, they were talking about like seeing a candidate who made a commercial that used AI images in the background. And like, so he's walking in front of like these made, made up images of, you know, him serving in the military, him giving out candy to kids or whatever. But then there's also on the other side of things, they were also talking about this example of a, a, an election in Slovakia recently where there was a video uh, that looked like one of the main candidates and a journalist, but it was like kind of stilted, I guess. And uh, the candidate was talking about, um, you know, insulting local voters, uh, according to Bloomberg, uh, discussing buying votes from the Roma minority and joking about child pornography, uh, which apparently had a very direct effect in their yeah, election. I mean, so I get the problem. I get the problem. You put that on anyone. If you anybody is accused of being a pedophile in any capacity, everything is over. Yeah. There's no there's no conversation about it. Rightfully, it's terrifying. But I can see where this is the initial concern is we're maybe already seeing it happen. Yeah. I think this is less about government and more about us. I think it's journalists' jobs to police this stuff and to learn how it works and to figure out better tools for evaluating what kind of images are real, what kind of videos are real, and verifying it with candidates. Yeah. I, think th I think that's maybe a more impactful, uh, uh, that could have more impact on this whole issue than what she's discussing with legislation, personally. I, yeah, I, it's so, it's so hard to know what the best way is going to be to approach this because I'm even thinking about 10 years ago mm -hmm. when fake websites would pop up that look like news websites right. and it was very difficult for most folks who are not in the media because um, media literacy is, is a tough thing. I think, or at least something that not everybody has had experience in to know that it's a fake website or that it's a fake byline. It's not written by a real person. And I remember how detrimental I think that was. And that was just, that wasn't a manipulation of images. That was just literally text. So right. this feels a little scary. We'll put a link to that hard fork uh, episode in the show notes because it was really helpful for me to understand the implications of AI and things like this. Mm -hmm. So... I don't know, Paul. I think it's an interesting discussion. I'll be curious to see how it affects our local elections here. I know I'm kind of like half scared and half super curious what these ads could look like. Because mm -hmm. I'm thinking about that ad that we saw. Was it last year? The guy that was like had fake poop falling from the sky. Oh, yeah. And like, I don't know. That's the most outlandish thing I could think of lately that we've seen in a campaign ad. Who knows what AI is going to bring us? Because there's that sort of uncanny valley dystopian thing that I think about when we look at AI generated photos. But that's usually because early, not early on, but when we were talking about feeding chat GBT a prompt that says like, show me punks in mid mod fat, you know, like mashing right. up the idea. You can clearly see these are not real images, but mm -hmm. If they're trying to fine tune something that's already a pretty real image that we know, I could see it being really difficult for us to decipher what's what. I hate it. I hate it. Okay. Well, I'm terrified of the future. Can't wait for my son to be able to use a computer. Okay. <laughs> I think it's exciting, personally. I think it's a interesting new interesting new way to uh, as long as we have the education. I think as long as we can try yeah. to stay a little bit ahead of the education component, so everybody feels safe in understanding the information they're being given. I don't know if anyone's ever going to feel safe. I know. I'm like, I mean, hi, propaganda. Again, what do you deserve? What are, you, what are your rights when it comes to voting in elections? Like, I think you have a responsibility to make an informed decision. And also, if you don't want to make an informed decision, you don't have to. You can vote however the hell you want. Sure. But also, the people presenting you with information that you are supposed to, they're trying to cater to your vote, should be have to be providing you with truthful information to the best of their knowledge. I, I agree. Yeah. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, more news. Hey, it's Paul Caroli, executive producer with CityCast Denver. You remember that time when I went to that retirement community to interview that mayoral candidate no one else was taking seriously, Renata Barron's? That was such a fun day for me. And I'm so glad that I got to bring her story and her actual ideas for the mayor's office to a much, much bigger audience than she'd had. And you know what? If it wasn't for CityCast Denver, I'm not sure any of us would have ever gotten to know Renata Barons. So become a member of CityCast Denver today. 
and uh, make sure we can keep doing that kind of thing for a long, long time to come. You also get to enjoy special perks like ad-free listening, event invites, and members-only updates. Just go to membership.citycast.fm. Thanks. And we're back. (laughs) One of our favorite topics. Transit and NIMBYs. Mm. Transit and the not back, not in my backyard, folks. Um, in particular, we're talking today about this Seventh Avenue bike lane situation. This has been going on for quite a while. Paul, will you remind us what this was all about? Yeah, so this was a this was a big battle, like last summer, when um, the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure began in began implementing some long planned changes on Seventh Avenue, really all across Capitol Hill. But Seventh Avenue became the the focal point of this. Uh, uh, debate, uh, to put it kindly. Um, what they were trying to do was make the streets safer and easier to ride bikes. That Because that's a current priority of the city, to make the whole city a better place to ride around on your bike. Maybe you commute to work, get out of your car more, help us contribute to our climate goals, et cetera, et cetera. They did stuff like uh, install some bollards, those like PVC looking pipes sticking Big out plastic. of the cement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, our friend Nate Miner at CPR, he told me that they're not technically bollards actually, but I forget the word he used. So you'll, we'll have to follow up on that. Um, but glow they also- sticks. <laughs> Some big PVC glow sticks. Pipe. They would be better if they were glow sticks. It'd be safer. Honestly, I may have just come up with a great idea. Feel free to steal that, city of Denver. <laughs> so <laughs> the issue is we're, we're getting more bollards? Uh, well, no, actually. So what the, the thing was at the time was they were temporary. And then, but uh, the, the, the people who lived in the neighborhood, who we're uh, referring to as NIMBYs here, but just happened to be neighbors, um, were very upset because they said they were ugly. They said they were confusing and they didn't like them. They just wanted them gone. Um, but they were temporary. Uh, so now the update is they're going to be permanent. Um, the Denver Bicycle Lobby put out this uh, press release last week, basically declaring victory in this battle because because Dottie has heard all of the complaints and they've decided to basically make everything that was temporary permanent with some alterations. This is great to me. I mean, we have to change the way our streets function and who they serve. And this has long been a conversation way before the bicycle lobby even existed of how do we make our streets safer for pedestrians and folks on bicycles and a more permanent solution to me seems especially in a highly pedestrian neighborhood like capitol hill Mm -hmm. this to me seems great not everybody's going to agree no not i mean i think a lot of the neighbors are going to be upset apparently there was a i didn't realize this but the bicycle lobby said there was a threat or they say a bluffed threat to recall the district five councilwoman over this no um yeah so it got it got pretty heated i i wonder what the blowback is going to be to this decision to make them permanent because i i kind of think that the neighbors are just going to move on and they're going to get used to it because part of these traffic changes in, in my uh, this is a theory but part of these traffic changes i think is just um just change itself yes. is uncomfortable yes but um Absolutely. but once you get used to it then it's just like you know it's just a street you know you'll get used to where the cars go and how to turn and if you've been in the neighborhood for a long time you feel certain ownership to the neighborhood which in, in ways is great, right? It's great when our neighbors and ourselves are invested in our communities and feel genuinely connected to that place and feel some ownership over it. And that's also what makes it really hard to change. Yeah. I yeah. would say. I'm not surprised by that at all. Um, but I... <laughs> I, the Denver Bicycle Lobby's email was pretty good, though. <laughs> yeah, what'd you, what would you what grabbed you about it? Something about blood... Oh, I don't know. Oh, yeah. It was something blood, very dramatic. <laughs> it was very dramatic. It was someone saying, we don't need to make these changes because nobody's died on their bicycles. Yep. And then the bicycle lobby's response was... The bicycle, we at the Denver Bicycle Lobby reject the idea that a blood sacrifice must be made to make improvements to a street. <laughs> They, they sometimes they get a little grandiose, the I, transit activists. I, I, I it's want, a very life and death thing sometimes. Yes. And I 100% agree with them. No one should have to die to fix a street. Yeah. But that is a little, it's a little much. It's a little much. Next battle. Yes. This is what I wanted to get into. So we've been watching this very, very slow crawl towards the reality for bus rapid transit on Colfax, which is a dedicated bus lane, Mm -hmm. a lane just for buses. This will also, again, change the traffic pattern of Colfax Avenue with um, the, at least the Denver section of this change on Colfax, the bus will now run in the middle of the street. Yeah, quite a significant change. Very, very, a big change for sure. Um, Construction's actually about to begin and um, there is a group that is not happy about it. 
Paul, what's going on? Well, the latest is uh, a couple of interesting things. One um, that really made it feel real to me. Like previously, it was always just, you know, it's press releases. It's, it's community ha- meetings. It's, it's renderings. It's like, yes, there's some a line, a line item in a budget for some money for this. It might happen. It's supposed to happen this year. We've been told that for a while. But it got really real when we got a press release from Denver Arts and Venues last week with requesting proposals from artists for 15 different stations along the proposed BRT line with up to $90,000 per station available. Wow. So like I that could be that I mean I don't I don't know exactly what the market is for for art and public art right now, but I feel like that's a, it's kind of exciting, right? I think it's really exciting because it also means if they're spending that much on the art, they're going to be spending a lot on the bus shelters. Yeah. Or at least I maybe this could be really good for people waiting for the bus on top of you get to look at beautiful art. True. I was in, um, I rode the BRT in Mexico City a couple of years ago when oh. I was visiting with my wife and their bus shelters are like, they're very sophisticated. They're very established. They're like big glass boxes in the middle of the street. Yes. So you're cut, sheltered from rain. And it, it does feel more like a, like a subway station in New York. Like you, you, you plug your, you, you punch your ticket and you walk in and you got benches to sit on and you know, all the messaging. And that's kind of what this is. It's like, we're not going to go full, build a brand new like light rail or a subway or something, but this is a lot of it aesthetically and at least for the person, human experience, will mimic that. And that to me is really exciting. I totally agree. And $90,000 worth of art on each one. I love it. I love this for the arts community too. We'll put a link to that RFP in the description because... I, I just can't mm-hmm. wait to see the art that we get. But there's pushback against this. Yes. Um, this was the other thing that came up last week. Uh, I stumbled across this new website, keepcalm.co. <laughs> um, and uh, there's a group that I had never heard of uh, calling themselves Citizen Action for a Livable Metro. Uh-huh. Which, uh, you know, um, and, and they're hosting a meeting actually this Thursday evening to organize folks who, who think the same way they do. Um, this is their mission statement. Um, they say, we need safe, sane streets with real solutions that slows traffic and saves lives. We support improved rapid transit, including a well-planned Colfax bus rapid transit system. Rude. However, as currently envisaged, the Colfax BRT will divert significant traffic to the major one way arteries 13th 14th 17th avenues and onto select side streets as well as through alleys with no guarantee that bus ridership will increase um etc cetera, etc cetera. 300 million dollars they're talking about how much it costs to build this thing um and then finally ensuring our neighborhood streets are safe will take citizen action please join us get involved together we will make a difference oh first of all like i always say safety is so subjective mm. What is safe? Who it's safe for? Who it's protecting? Who views it as safe? So that is uh, number one for me. Number two, there's no names on this website. You don't know. This is a very looming. This is like some or overlord group. You don't know who's involved, but you can come to the meeting to find out. And you better believe I will. I know I was going to say, and uh, we'll probably be there. Um, Yeah, I, I think that the conversation about out of control traffic is very confusing on this website. We think concerted citizen action has a role to play in reining in out of control traffic, demanding a balance between efficient car routes, improved rapid transit and genuinely safe and accessible bikeways and walkways. So it's like almost like they're playing to both sides. Mm -hmm. So it's very confusing for someone who's maybe walking into the BRT conversation for the first time. Yeah. Um, I would also just say, uh, well, folks here at keepcom.co, Um, We've been talking about this in the public space for at least seven years, at at least the go bond, the general obligation bond that we as Denver voters voted on that included funding for this project. We voted on in 2017. The city has been talking about it since then. You have had seven years to put a pause or whatever they said to this project. So, and I, again, it's that I probably the, we didn't know or whatever the argument is. We never heard about it. It, I worked on Colfax. Granted, I worked in urban planning. This thing was all over my radar. It was a conversation that they were having with business owners, with people on who live on the street. This has been a conversation. Yeah, you were probably desperate to find people to tell about this, to get their input. (laughs) Well, yeah, exactly. To find it, like to 
to find out how they would might maybe utilize that or what their concerns were. Because I will say some business owners would tell you this is going to limit um, the amount of car traffic, right? Which is good for us in theory to keep pedestrians safer, to make the bus the better option. Sometimes for business owners, they're going to tell you though, and I, I'm not discounting this argument is, well, p- folks need to be able to pull right up to my business right. and this is going to make it harder and yeah. tra- parking in Capitol Hill is already a nightmare, you know, the things we already know. Mm-hmm. But I would say... The traffic in or the the parking in Cap Hill already being a nightmare is a long simmering symptom of a problem that I think BRT is meant to help and alleviate. And I, as a person that lived in Capitol Hill 20 years ago and had a hard time parking, it's still the same problem. Honestly, when people talk about like neighborhoods changing and the characters of neighborhoods, if if it was ever easy to park in Capitol Hill, I might feel a little bit melancholy <laughs> about it. You know, I, that's it, where as I far learned, as I'm concerned, it never was. Yeah, that's where I learned how to parallel park. Same, Paul. <laughs> I've got nostalgia for that Same. horrible parking quagmire. <laughs> and I would also just say there's just this like tiny amount of privilege in this argument that frustrates me because it, I would love BRT to come to Alameda. Mm. I would love for BRT to come to Federal Boulevard. The traffic situation in my neighborhood is deadly. And I would hazard to guess I have more deadly intersections on my side of town than these folks do. And this, and I, I wonder, I would wonder what our ridership would look like there because Alameda is a main corridor, just like Colfax. Federal is a main corridor. And I, I think, think federal's of, on the list. It is on the list. So like, be excited. You get to be the innovators. You get to be the first neighborhood to start this change in our city, which I will also remind folks, harkens back to this idyllic dream we have of how Denver used to be with a streetcar, right? Yeah. This is a very similar thing. Yeah, it could it could feel like that. Although I think it might feel like its own thing a little bit. For sure. I mean, we don't know. That's the other thing is like we don't really know any of this stuff. They're, that's where they have a point. You know, it's not a guarantee that bus ridership will increase. It's we have a good bet. I think there's a, a good chance that a lot of people are going to find this useful. It is going to be a lot faster. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm personally excited about trying it out. I don't know if it's going to be a, a habit for me. Um, the other thing I think they have a point about, at least in the short term, and this is what worries me, is the construction of these stations is going to be a pain. And it is going to make Colfax a lot worse. Of course. Temporarily. Of course. And All th- large construction projects do. We just went through this on Broadway. But right? the more the more people experience that for themselves, the more they'll be drawn to this sort of group. And I think if, if, if that happens and they build a lot of support against it, it might be a problem for the broader project. Which would suck because if yeah. Colfax gets it and Alameda or Federal doesn't because of this... That would be very frustrating to yeah. me. This is this is one of the big stories, I think, of the whole year. The way this thing yeah. plays out, this construction project for BRT, like we, we're going to learn a lot about where Denver is when it comes to transit. I mean, we go through this every time we do a major infra- infrastructure project. It is an inconvenience for the current time. It may provide something better for the future. Well, honestly, I think, you know, we had a couple of real juicy topics this week. So let's just say like, let's no listener feedback this week. Let's we're going to do more next week. Yeah. But we want to hear from you about these topics. These were really interesting ones. Um, Absolutely. AI in this election this year. What do you all think? And then Colfax BRT. Am I going to see you at the meeting um, or leave us a voicemail? Send us a text at 720-500-5418. We really do want to hear from you. We want to know what you think. Um, yeah, City especially Cast if Denver, you live in this area. Especially, Absolutely yes. want to hear from especially, you. Especially, yes. Again, Again, leave us a voicemail or send us a text to 720-500-5418. Well, thanks for joining me, Paul. See you next time, Brie. That's all for today here on CityCast Denver. If you enjoyed this show, why not take a minute to tell Secretary of State Jenna Griswold about us? Rate the show wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to our morning newsletter and learn more about us at denver.citycast.fm. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Bye-bye. It's in a box called Bree's Special Stuff, which my brother saw once and was like, that looks like it's full of crap. Of course, that's your special stuff. I was like, I love you. Thank you for being my brother.